Chapter Three of Julia Reed. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Julia Reed by Pansy. Chapter Three In Which I Meet the Social Question. We were alone for a few minutes after that. Callers took Mrs. Tyndall to the parlor, and the doctor drew his chair nearer to mine with a look of genuine pleasure beaming on his face. Do you know, Julia, he commenced at once, there is one reason why I am particularly glad of the position you have assumed. There are some girls with whom you will come in contact for whom I am specially anxious. They are in my class in Sabbath school, gay, wild girls, who have had few advantages, religiously at least, and most of them few enough of any sort. I think there is no influence, save that of absolute indifference, brought to bear upon them now, at the shop, I mean. So do you see why I am glad of your position? It will be a responsible one, Julia. I want you to use it carefully and prayerfully. Instead of answering him at once, I fell to thinking of Mrs. Tyndall's description, girls whom he has picked up from goodness knows where, shop girls, I believe somebody said they were, with a strongly marked emphasis on the word shop. I remembered what injury Dr. Douglas had done by refusing the other class. I reflected that he was evidently considered a fanatic by at least some of the people of Newton, and for the first time in my life I questioned the wisdom of the doctor's proceedings. Added to this was a feeling of irritation that he should seem to class me so promptly with the shop girls. There was a difference, I argued, between a bookkeeper and a girl who dabbled in the paste all day, while underneath it all lay a sense of shame that I was really so shallow-brained as to care for this distinction and a vague sense of wonderment as to whence it had sprung, for I had fancied myself above it. All these feelings combined gave point and sharpness to my tone and words when I finally answered my waiting friend. I will use my influence as well as I can, of course, when I am with the girls, but I suppose I can hardly be expected to find associates among the shop girls. The slightest possible elevation of the doctor's eyebrows showed me that I was giving him a new phase of my character, but he answered me gravely. It is a Christian influence of which I am in search, and that, if true and pure, will be exerted wherever there are souls to call it forth, and an opportunity offered, and it will matter very little what work the bodies of those souls happen to be engaged in. I was familiar with these and like sentiments expressed by Dr. Douglas, and had been wont to admire them, but on the particular evening of which I write they sounded to me decidedly fanatical. The doctor at once changed the subject by asking me if I had passed a pleasant evening. I assured him that I had, and grew animated in my admiration of Mrs. Tyndall, and again I noticed that grave, almost sad look come into his face, and he replied thoughtfully, I fancied you would not particularly admire her. Well, I said testily, is that the reason why you exerted yourself to secure board for me here, because you thought I would at once take a dislike to the lady of the house, and so find my abiding place extremely pleasant and desirable? The doctor brought his eyes back from vacancy and fixed them on me with a little good-humored laugh. I beg your pardon and hers, he said brightly. I didn't mean that. I only meant to say that I imagined you a remarkably penetrative young lady. It is an honor to you that you are not. I am sure I don't like suspicious people. But come, Julia, you and I must not quarrel. We are brother and sister, you know. But, though I hadn't the slightest idea what was the trouble with me, I could not get back into pleasant humor. No, we are not, I answered sharply. That is nonsense. How do I know but you are going to be married next week, in which case we would be only strangers to each other. I have never forgotten the look of pain which swept over Dr. Douglas's face, as I made this careless allusion to his sorrowful past, nor the absolute pallor which settled upon it as he answered me in a low, grave voice after a few minutes of silence. Julia, I will not remind you that my wife is in the grave, that you already know. Neither will I say to you that I shall never marry, because all such expressions seem to me foolish and uncalled for. But perhaps it would be as well to say to you that nothing is further from my present plans and intentions than marriage, before I add that if I were to be married to-morrow I do not see how that would alter the fact that I have always tried to be to you the friend that Esther loved to think I would be, and that I have the most earnest desire to continue to be your friend and helper in every possible way. 
I have always been glad that for a moment at least I came back to myself and said frankly, I don't know what possessed me to speak such rude and nonsensical words to you, doctor. I hope you will forgive me. He smiled and bowed in his old frank way and said, Now let me speak at once of a matter which I have in my mind. How about the books, Julia? Then, indeed, he touched upon a sore subject. I had most earnestly desired a thorough education, and great had been the battle to be fought ere plain common sense won the victory. I answered the question meekly enough. The books are at the bottom of my trunk and likely to remain there. It is bread and shoes now instead of books. Why not devote your evenings to them? Two of your evenings will be occupied, at least I hope they will. Thursday is the church prayer meeting evening, and on Saturday is our young people's meeting, and I have greatly counted on your presence and assistance there. But that arrangement leaves you four, and in the line of teacher I think we could manage, at least I used to earn the bread and shoes that you speak of in that way during my vacations of study. Do you mean that you will help me? I said with brightening eyes, and I thought that was the best thing he could ever do for me. So before I went to my room that evening, a course of study had been planned and all but commenced. I was very excited and glad over it, and moved around my gem of a room not at all with the sense of desolation that I expected to have. On the whole, my prospects seemed very pleasant. I rather dreaded the morrow's ordeal, but after all I told myself there could be nothing so very hard about that, and the evenings should atone for the days. How I would study! then certainly nothing could be more charming than this home into which I had been cordially received, and no person could be more delightful than Mrs. Tyndall. At thought of her my mind went wandering over our evening's talk, and one little uneasy feeling possessed me. I recalled the fact that of every person whom she had mentioned that evening, she had said something, should I call it uncharitable? Oh, no, certainly that sweet, low voice could not have said other than kindly words, Besides, she had seemed so anxious not to impress me unfavorably. She had spoken repeatedly of the goodness of Dr. Mulford and his wife, and then I laughed again at the memory of the comic faces, and said, What a queer man he must be! And it certainly was foolish in Mrs. Mulford to offend tasteful people in such a simple and easily regulated manner as a choice of colors. And Mrs. Tyndall spoke very kindly of them both, and how interested she was in her Sabbath school class. Who was that girl, I wondered? Who was that one discordant element? Of course Mrs. Tyndall was not to blame if her class would not assimilate. Perhaps this one was a shop girl, and would be better in Dr. Douglas's class. I winced a little at thought of those shop girls with whom I must mingle more or less. Shop girls had gone two steps down the social ladder since morning. Why? I couldn't possibly tell. Was it that peculiar tone which Mrs. Tyndall's voice had taken when she spoke the words? And there struggled together in my mind the two thoughts, to be faithful to the girls of Dr. Douglas's class, to use my influence in the right direction, and to let Mrs. Tyndall know that I belonged to a different class of beings, and had been accustomed to different society, and while I was trying to decide whether or not Mrs. Tyndall was right and Dr. Douglas a most decidedly fanatical man, I fell asleep. Just as I was moving to my desk the next morning, after a somewhat lengthy explanatory conversation with Mr. Gatman, Mr. Sales called to me, A word with you, if you please, Miss Reed. And I went to him in the little square room where the box stove was, whose object seemed to be to serve as a footstool for the two gentlemen. I am afraid you will have not very pleasant persons to deal with for a few days at least, he began, nodding his head toward the workroom by way of explanation. The fact is, there is a sort of blind insurrection in there. The girls are disposed to resent this infringement on what they consider their rights. You see, they have been used to having a gentleman to torment, and they managed to plague the life nearly out of the last one we had. What I wish to say is, that perhaps you will do well not to notice any little annoyances or trifling rudenesses more than you can help, and the thing will probably come all right in a few days. You see, they are in something of a predicament themselves. They have no complaint to make to us, because they don't want us to know that they rebel, so they have no resort but to revenge themselves upon you. Oh, there will be nothing serious, of course, only a little nonsense, perhaps. They are a gay set, but good workers. Their places would be rather difficult to fill, and one trouble is they know it. 
This talk did not serve to increase my composure. It seemed to me to mean, you will have trouble enough, but don't complain to us. I only bowed in response and went at once to the workroom. My seat was at the further end of the room, near a window. I traversed the length of the room, conscious that ten pairs of eyes were leveled at me, and my ears gave me evidence of several ill-suppressed giggles. On my chair was a huge pan of paste, in which I had nearly seated myself before I noticed it, and the merriment increased. I had it in my heart to peremptorily order somebody to take the thing away, but, on reflecting that I knew none of them, and that my order was quite likely to be disregarded, I had the good sense to wait on myself. I dumped the sticky pan down on the floor, with, perhaps, an unnecessarily hard thud, helped myself uninvited to an apron which hung near me, and used it to wipe off the daubs of paste that had dripped from the pan, then took my seat and my account book. I have reason to think that my first composed and independent reception of their courtesies was a success, for, although the whole bevy of them continued in the highest state of frolic and laughter during the day, I was, despite Mr. Sale's awful warning, left in comparative peace. In the course of the morning, having put my account book into something like working order, I had leisure to observe the girls, and despite the fact that they were every one of them shop girls, I found myself actually admiring them. What a bright, pretty company they were! Every one of them had good, intelligent faces, and several of them were extremely pretty. The most of them had rather dashing manners, a sort of recklessness about their movements, unpleasant to see, and at first unaccountable to me, but I came in time to this decision, which I never had occasion to change, that whatever of recklessness or indifference to the public opinion was noticeable in them, was due in a marked degree to the public itself, to the air of superiority which that public constantly assumes toward them. Not because they are ignorant, for Frank Hooper, a shop-girl, was better educated than General Park's daughter Anna, who ignored Frank's existence when she met her on the street. Not because they were girls of disreputable character, for I never met a purer, sweeter girl than Ruth Walker, the fair-haired young creature who worked down at the lower end of our shop, but simply and solely, so far at least as I could discover, because they were shop-girls, and so belonging of necessity to the lower rank of beings. This, at least, was the demoralizing process brought to bear upon the girls in our shop, and it had its results. Now I, in my busy, secluded life, had known very little about the daily companionship of girls of my own age. In school I had been a hard student, and of late years had only gone thither for recitations, and hurried home betimes to help my dear, overburdened mother. So among the things about this new life of mine that had seemed pleasant to me, was this one of having friends among the girls, and I honestly think that no idea of being infinitely superior to them all had entered my brain until that first evening spent in Mrs. Tyndall's sitting-room. What had called it forth? I did not realize then. I do now. End of chapter 3 Recording by Tricia G.